Amen. Uh, you can open your Bibles to Luke chapter 3 and also um, get to your Bibles in Isaiah chapter 40. We're going to be in those two places. We'll start off in Luke and, and then we'll get to Isaiah chapter 40. But again, I, I want to make, uh, uh, how can I do this? I guess a public, um, you know what, Roy, or can somebody hand me that black for a moment? If I don't turn the projector off, it gets really, really hot up there, and I'll sweat more than I normally do when I preach. And, and I don't want that, and, and nobody else likes that either. It takes me back to the days when we used to um, worship and, and kind of help in the service in Bolivia. And I would, I would do music mainly in that service, and uh, it was so, so hot. And I'm up there playing guitar and singing in Spanish, and that, that had a whole level, and sweat would just start to just pour off of me, and it was just, it was not a fun way to hang on to a guitar pick. So anyway, I, I try not to sweat when I preach as much as possible. <laughs> but I want to make a, a, a public acknowledgement of, of Kenny and his messages that the Word has blessed him in, in preaching. Kenny always, it's, it's a blessing for me to know that, that if I'm not here in the pulpit, and you are, you're sharing God's word, and it's not just you're filling in, you're sharing what God would, would have you share, and, and a word for, for all of us, and I, I get so much out of your, your preaching. I listen to it, not in a, in a critical way or critiquing in any way, but, but as, a, as a way to, to grow spiritually, and, it, and it, it never ceases to bless me, so thank you, brother, for that. I appreciate it, and, and I'm excited to be back in the pulpit. It's been, I guess it's, well, Two, two weeks, I guess two weeks since I preached, or three weeks since I preached in, in, uh, in Tennessee. So it's, it's, it's nice. It's, I love to be in, in the pulpit to preach and to bring God's word. And, and always my, my prayer, God, I pray before I come here, is, is uh, Lord, let me be a conduit and unclog that con conduit. I, I don't want anything to hinder the word of God coming forth. Um, let me not own the message like the, the channel that a river flows through, you know, that, that channel doesn't own that water. I don't own this message, God. It's your message to bring to all of us. And so bless me in that, but bless you in that your eyes are open and your ears are unclogged and your heart has that soil that's broken up, ready to receive the, the true seed of the word of God. So that's, that's my prayer this morning, that, that God has prepared you as I pray that he's prepared me, and even in the midst of this, he's still working on us to teach us something. Because I think, without a doubt, there's something to be taught. As we look, and, and today we'll focus on those verses that we read, we'll focus on a few more verses than we read, but about preparation. And what that means, especially in the season of Advent. And I'll ask you this question because I've asked it many times of people, and I've been asked of it many times already in this Christmas season. Are you ready for Christmas yet? Have you been asked that question? Are you ready for Christmas yet? What do I mean when I say, are you ready for Christmas yet? What do I mean? Buy your yeah. Did you buy your stuff yet? Did you get your presents? If you have kids, did you buy their presents? Have, it, have they been wrapped? Have you made your plans? Are you having uh, a meal with family? Is the menu laid out? Parties, all this stuff. And, and it just reminds us of how much preparation we take as we approach this Christmas season. I mean, there's preparation in so many things that we do in our parties for the teens, in our parties as, as the Christmas or the church, there's preparation involved. We are this is such a busy, busy time. And I want us to, to not get lost in the busyness. Because that happens for me. And I was talking and have been talking this week with, with my brother-in-law, John, the, the preacher up in, in Davis. And, and we just talk about how busy this time is for pastors. And, and it's funny because we say this, and, and I tell him this, I said, I will probably begin to take a deep breath about 9 o'clock on Christmas Eve. And if you know why it's 9 o'clock on Christmas Eve, we've gone through all of the stuff that we're doing, all the preparation, we've gone through our Christmas Eve service, and then finally I can feel like I can and relax. Because if you're not ready at that point, you're not going to be ready. But it is a busy time. It's a busy time for all of us. But I want us to, to make special note of the preparation that we need to have in our lives in a spiritual sense. As we prepare for this time to remember for the first advent, remember when God became flesh as we sung about, but also 
preparation for the second advent, for the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because I don't ever, please don't do this. As we approach the Christmas season, we think about Christ and, and him coming and God becoming flesh. He's no longer that baby in a manger. That's right. You can't have that image of Christ in a manger now. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's our high priest. He's gone there to prepare a place for us, and he's coming back. Amen. And so don't ever look at this Advent season as just the first coming. Be reminded and hopeful and longing for his second coming. Amen. So I want to make sure that we're prepared for that as well. So as we approach here in, in Luke chapter 3, and we're getting into this, um, let, me, let me go ahead and read this. I want to read these verses, three, or chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And it talks about in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iteria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went out into all the region around Jordan and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Father, we ask your blessings upon your word as it has been read. And now as it is expounded upon Holy Spirit, we ask, you are here. We know that. We acknowledge that. Teach us. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want us to, to set the scene because Luke has set for us a very historical scene. So we know the time frame. If you go to, to Jewish his, history and you read uh, Josephus' works, we know the timetable, the time frame that's here. And I want us to just be reminded of, of what's already happened. During this time, Jesus has already been born. The logos, the word, has become flesh and begin his tabernacle period with mankind. So that's happened. Jesus has been born. Jesus has already passed through his teenage years. And I, when, I, when I wrote this down and I thought about this, I just I chuckle. Sarah, you chuckle as well. John Lydia, you probably are chuckling as well. Any of us who have raised Matt, Fran, you were probably chuckling as well. Those teenage years. Oh, Lord, help us when, when we have children <laughs> passing through these teenage years. They say it goes fast. Yeah, it, I'm sure it does. But there are days where it's, it's not very fast. Amen to that? Amen. <laughs> Rachel, Rachel, did you, did you amen? Uh, amen. See, yeah, Rachel, she, she feels more Hebrewish if she says Amen. So, teenage years, yes, but Jesus passed through these teenage years without ever sinning. Amen. What a joy it had to have been to raise Jesus through these teenage years. But Jesus has passed through those. He's passed through the transition into early adulthood. And now Jesus is standing upon the precipice of becoming an adult entering into being a rabbi 30 years of age. That's where we find all of this taking place. The 30th year of our Lord and Savior as he is with mankind. And that's what's on sort of the surface here. We have a man from Galilee. A man who has a mother named Mary and a, and a father named Joseph. And Jesus would have entered into, into a skill, into a trade. And we know that as, as being carpenter. He would have been a carpenter, just like his father or the man who raised him. We know truly who his father is, but his earthly father. But now Jesus stepping out of that in his 30th year to enter into what we know as his public ministry, as a rabbi. But more than that, that's kind of on the surface. That's what, that's what the people in the region were seeing. Here comes another rabbi. But we know him as Israel's Messiah. We know him as the Christ. We know him as the Lamb of God. We know him, I hope, 
as our Savior, the Savior of the world. So that's, that's sort of the, the time frame that we're at here. His earthly ministry is beginning. But prior to that, something had to happen. Something had to occur first before Jesus in his public ministry takes the scene. And the Jewish people get this. They understand this. Now, they don't understand the full expansion of this, but they get it in one degree, and they, they, they exhibit this even in their Passover time because at the Passover meal, there is an empty seat. And who is that meal for, or who is that table setting for? It's for Elijah. They are waiting on the prophet Elijah because they do understand that unless the prophet Elijah comes, the Messiah can't come. But here is where the faultiness in Judaism takes hold and where the completion of Judaism in Christ, it falls by the wayside for so many Jewish people. Elijah has come. And indeed, Jesus says, if you believe this, Elijah has come. And he came, and it wasn't Elijah in the sense that Elijah in bodily form, who Elijah was one who never died. But it wasn't Elijah in bodily form coming, but it was John the Baptist coming as the Elijah to do what we just read, to prepare the way of the Lord, to make his path straight to prepare the way for the Messiah. So that's what's taking place. And it's not, when Elijah would come on the scene, it's not necessarily one of these, I want to be careful with this wording because I, I kind of, when I wrote it, I went back and I, and I scratched it out and changed it up. Originally I had, it's not necessarily a spectacular occurrence. But when we read what really was happening, it is a spectacular occurrence. When John the Baptist comes on the scene, when Elijah comes on the scene preparing the way for the Messiah. Now, it's not one of, of flashes of light. It's not like the birth of Christ. There weren't angels coming and, and doing all of these things. But as we get into this, you're going to see how spectacular it is that truly John the Baptist has come on the scene prior to Jesus coming into his earthly ministry. But again, I want to I fill in some gaps here with, with sort of the, the history of, of what's taking place, how, how Luke has laid this out. Um, Tiberius Caesar, he reigned from, uh, well, from his reign, we know we're talking about AD 29, and most scholars say give or take a year. So we're from AD 28 to AD 30. That's the time when Jesus is coming onto the scene in public ministry. Pilate, he reigned in Judah uh, roughly... 10 years, AD 26 to AD 36. Herod's reign was 4 BC to AD 39. Philip was 4 BC to AD 34. Now, you come in in verse 2, and you hear about Caiaphas, and you hear about Annas, and both speaking about being a high priest. Now, Caiaphas was the high priest at this time, and his holding that, that office was from AD 18 to the year 36. Now, Annas was high priest from the year 6 to 15, but he left the office. But here's, the, here's where things began to just fall apart. If you read in the Old Testament and you know the Jewish law, man did not pick the high priest. It, it wasn't, or, or even a prophet. This wasn't something that man just sort of vied for and raised his hand and said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. That's, that sounds good. And the sad part about Judaism at this point with the Roman occupation is the Romans picked Caiaphas to be high priest. That was never the intent of Judaism. It wasn't supposed to work like that. And you begin to see how Judaism was becoming something more of less about a religion that was going to connect them with God, but more about political, political posturing, power, control, politics. Politics, and here's, here's the thing, and... and and we need this word, I think, in our day and age. Don't allow religion not to permeate politics, but please keep politics out of religion. Amen. We as Christians have to allow our faith in Christ to affect how we vote, how we do things in what we have here as a democracy in our country, but we better keep the politics of this country out of our religion. 
That's not how religion, and I mean religion in the truest sense. I don't mean it in just going through the motions. I mean it in living our lives for Christ and for God. Don't let politics come into that. It's so easy. James warns about that kind of thing. He doesn't call it politics, but he's like, be careful who you put preference upon. Don't do that. We have to guard against that. But that's what was happening with the high priest, all of these things. And then we find something happened. And again, the logos, the word, Jesus, he's already become flesh. But we find out here in verse 2, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, that's why they mention both. Because the reality is um, Caiaphas was Anna, Annas, he was his son-in-law. So that's kind of showing the... the uh, the relationship there. But during this time, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Now, that is John the Baptist. But I want to just kind of camp out on this for a little bit. Because it's not the logos. It's not that word came. But it's the rhema. And here's what that means. The word here means the spoken word. And what that can literally mean is a command. And now when we see that, we know what, we should know, what the word of God is, who God is in this. And so we see that it comes to John. Now, here's the neat thing about the name John. It literally means God is gracious. That's why we named Evan, Evan, Evan. We didn't want to name him John because we have, my brother-in-law's name is John. But Evan is the Welsh form of John because we knew that we weren't supposed to have any more children. We've been told it's, it's too risky. You are not supposed to have any more children. We have three daughters. I have reconciled my fact that I would have three daughters that at some point will all be teenagers at the same time. I'm still reconciling my mind to that reality. I've got two now, one to go. But, but anyway, we had come to that point. We can't have any more kids. We're not going to have any more kids. And then when Miriam was six months old, we found out God had other plans for us. And there we were, we had, and we didn't know at the time, but, but we had a son. And we realized God is so gracious to us. Amen. And so that's why his name is Evan. And when you think of his name, think of that. Be reminded, because God continue, continually, even, even though I, I make fun, the fact of having teenagers and children, God is gracious to us Amen. with our kids. Amen. We love our kids. You're wonderful kids. I guess kid, you're the only one here. You're a wonderful daughter, Rachel. You truly are. You're a blessing to us, and we talk about it often. But God is gracious. So I want you to kind of fill in these words now that we just kind of talked about. The command of God, of Yahweh, the command of God came to God is gracious. So you can kind of see what's about to take place on the scene here. God is giving a command. To John, to someone named God is gracious. And John is that last of the Old Testament prophets. He's the last one. But here's what we need to understand. It had been roughly 460 years since there has been a word from God given to a prophet in Israel. 460 years. Let that Attempt to let that soak in for just a moment. 460 years. Now, things were going on, but really what was happening a lot during these times between the end of the Old Testament and then where we begin in the New Testament was there was a lot of religion taking place. And I don't necessarily mean that in a good way. A lot of religion was going on, but no prophetic word to Israel through the prophet that God would call. But we find, and we know if you study the life of John the Baptist, God was calling him from even inside the womb because he had a purpose for John the Baptist. He had a purpose for what his message was going to be. But I want to read to you the last verses, last verse and a half of the Old Testament from the prophet Malachi. This is God speaking through Malachi. And this is what he says. It's magnificent. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. That's verse 5, verse 6. I'm only going to read the first part of it. And he will turn the hearts. That was the last promise that was given to Israel in the Old Testament until the time the word of God came to John the Baptist 
in the New Testament, 460 years. So for 460 years, they're hanging on to that promise that God's going to send Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome, and we spoke a lot about that word in Sunday school, an awesome day, an awestruck day of the Lord. And this Elijah is going to come, and he's going to turn hearts. And now we find John the Baptist. He has this word from the Lord. And we find John. What is John doing? He went into all the region around Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. He wasn't baptizing people so that once they were baptized, they were then saved. It wasn't a sacramental aspect. And, 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 I, and I've heard teachers of, of, of Judaism say, and, and, I, and I'll take their word for it, he wasn't probably the only rabbi baptizing there's the mikvah. There is that aspect of a ceremonial baptism that the Jewish people did. Baptism didn't just start as a Christian concept. But the reality and the fulfillment of baptism did come through Christ. And John is baptizing for the repentance of the forgiveness of sins. And it's the same kind of baptism that we do. What do we do? If we are baptized before we come to faith in Christ, that baptism is null and void. Amen. It doesn't do anything for you. Nothing. But if we are baptized as we partake in, in a believer's baptism, it still doesn't save you, but what it does is it proclaims outwardly what God has already done inwardly by the work of the Holy Spirit through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are making a public profession of faith in Christ, and in a ceremonial way, in a very outward display, we are showing that we've been cleansed of our sins by Christ. And we come out of that water. We are new creations in Christ. We are buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in a new life. We are new creations in Jesus. And so John is out there and he's baptizing for repentance of sins. He's baptizing because really what's going on here is he is beginning to clear the way for the Messiah to come. Now I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 4. And we're looking at verses 3, 4, and 5 in Isaiah chapter 40. Now I want you to remember this context as well. This is written some 700 years before Christ is born. And we find, and, and there's a little variation in, in the translation from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But, I, but I, I love what Isaiah is saying, what God is saying through the prophet Isaiah here. A voice cries, or a voice is crying out. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Now, let's, let's kind of take this for just a moment. Prepare the way. For whom? For the Lord. In the Old Testament, you see the, the capital L, little capital O, little capital R, little capital D. We've talked about this before. That means Jehovah. And literally what Jehovah means in Hebrew is Yahweh. So look at what Isaiah is saying. A voice is crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of Yahweh. Prepare the way of God Almighty for Jehovah. And this is super, super significant of why, why Isaiah is saying this and what I want us to remember on this. Because God himself is coming. Not just a man who is going to speak on, be God, on, on behalf of God. Not just a man anointed by God. God himself is coming to Israel. This was the promise that was given 700 years before Christ was born, before God in the flesh came. But God is telling his people, I'm coming. And here's what's going to happen when I come. Make straight in the desert, a highway for God, for Elohim, for ultimately, for Yahweh. And here's what the idea is. When a king would be moving into a certain region, you know, they're traveling on dirt paths. And dirt paths would get littered. And I don't necessarily mean by trash, but I mean by rocks and debris and these kind of things. So somebody would have to move on that path before the king came and begin clearing the path. So the king and his procession could come on a path that would not in any way, shape, or form molest him moving in to this region. Nothing would hinder the king to move forward on this path. 
The same thing is true of Yahweh. Isaiah is saying, when Yahweh comes to visit his people, and this is what is so, I don't want to say frustrating, but I just pray and wish God would open the eyes of the Jewish people. Because it says right here that God himself is coming. But yet when Jesus came and made the bold statements that I and the Father are one, they rip their clothing. And they're looking around for stones because, hey, this guy just blasphemed. We're going to kill him. But God is saying right here, I'm coming back to my people. Amen. And you better make sure that the path that Yahweh is coming on is clear of debris. Get all the trash off of the road. And what I take into this, understanding when this came and when the promise of Elijah came in Malachi and then 460 years later, we have Jesus coming into this, into this ministry. What I think is being said here is you better take all of that religion that has cluttered this path for Yahweh to come in on and you better clear it out of the way. Elijah is going to come and clear all of this religion out of the way. John the Baptist was coming to clear all of this religion out of the way to prepare the hearts of the people to receive their true king, their Messiah. And so Isaiah says, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And this is wonderful. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain, flat. Here's what's being said here. The, the ground at the cross, which is where ultimately God in the flesh was going, is level ground. What does that mean? How do we take that? I don't mean physically a level ground. But I mean if you're rich, you're poor, you're smart, you're dumb, you're fast, you're lame, you're black, you're white, you're slave, you're free, you're Jew, you're Gentile. It does not matter. Because whosoever believes in Christ shall be saved. Amen. So that, that, that those, those valleys are going to be raised up. Those mountains are going to be brought down. Those bumpy areas are going to be smoothed out like a plain. Because everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. There are people who will scoff at that. But here's the reality of this. Jump down to verse 5. And the glory of the Lord, the glory of Yahweh, shall be revealed. And, and here's, this is what unlocks what I just said. All flesh shall see it together. This is a promise. This is a promise, and it's, it's a little seed that was planted in the ground that didn't bear fruit until Christ, and it really didn't come to a full understanding until the Apostle Paul to share what is the mystery of the gospel. Here's the mystery of the gospel, and I don't mean mystery like you got to go out and you got to look at the, the clues and, and try to figure out. What I mean is something that's veiled, but at some point later will be unveiled. It will be revealed. Here's the mystery of the gospel. It's for the Jew first. And then for the Gentile. And this is the promise that Isaiah gives 700 years before the Messiah would be born. The glory of Yahweh shall be revealed. Who's it going to be revealed to? Well, I already said that every valley is going to be lifted up. Every mountain is going to be made low. And uneven ground is going to become level. And the rough places are going to be a plain. Why? Because all flesh shall, shall see it together. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter your, your social stance or your bank accounts or, or even how, how the, the world looks at you. None of that matters. Because the ground at the cross is level. Whosoever shall believe upon the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever trusts in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That is the truth that we get from Isaiah 700 years before Christ was even born. Because here's the reality. Jesus came, yes, to lay down his life. That's what he did. But in so doing, he was building a kingdom. And if you're going to have a kingdom, guess what? You've got to have citizens. You've got to have people who make up this kingdom. <clears throat> and who makes up that kingdom is those who come to the cross and see that level ground and realize 
He did this for me. He laid down his life for me. I may be nobody. I may not be the smartest person in the world. I may not be the richest person. But it doesn't matter because he did this for me. And so by believing and trusting in what he's done for me on the cross, I can become part of this kingdom. I can become a citizen of heaven. And Christian, that's who you are. You are a citizen of heaven. I am a citizen of heaven. We have addresses down here on earth. We have license, your driver's licenses. We have identification. We have all of these things. Uh, Karen, you know this very well. We have a residence here on earth. And we are citizens of the United States. Praise the Lord for that. We're citizens of West Virginia, of Tucker County, some Randolph, but you understand what I'm saying. Some, we consider you guys too in that panhandle. You're part of West Virginia. We'll include you guys. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Almost. But the reality of it is, is we are citizens that transcends all of this down here on earth. We are citizens in heaven because what Christ has done and because we believe it. We trust in it. We give him our soul based upon the promises that he made. And here's the beauty of the promises that Jesus makes. And I thought about this. When Jesus makes a promise, there's two things involved in that. There's the promise, and then there's power. Now, there are people here on earth, and we've all done it. We've made promises. But we don't have the power within ourselves to keep that promise. And then there's other people here on earth that have power, but they don't make any kind of promises. But Jesus makes a promise, and he has the power to keep it. And he has ultimately all the power, and he makes promises based upon the power that he has. So we have these promises that if we so believe, then we are becoming and are already citizens of heaven. And so you think now what's taking place here. This is what John the Baptist was coming to do, to clear the path littered with 460 years of religious garbage and debris so that the king may come and build a kingdom and make citizens to be with him forever and ever and ever. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. Why? For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The mouth of Yahweh has spoken. There's a promise. There's power. And it shall come to pass. So the question is, number one, are you part of this kingdom? Are you part of this kingdom through what Christ has done for you on the cross? If you're not part of this kingdom, you can become part of this kingdom. You've got to reach out in faith. You've got to take hold of what's already been done for you. Christ doesn't have to go and be re-crucified, re-buried, and re-resurrected. It's all finished. He said it. It is done. Just trust in it. Not just up here, but with your heart, with everything you've got. Place your faith. Rest your soul upon what Jesus has done. But are you prepared for this king to return again? We need to be preparing and be prepared and live our lives in such a way. With, and, and we acknowledge it up here, but I wonder sometimes if we, we tend to forget in here that it could be any moment that this king returns, that he calls us home, that we go up there to that place he's prepared for us, and forever we will be with the Lord. Are you prepared for that? And I don't just say that to non-Christians, I say that to Christians as well. Are we prepared for that? Are we ready for that? We need to be the wise virgins and make sure there's oil in our lamps because he's coming like a thief in the night. And he is coming because, again, that is a promise and he's got the power to do it. But finally, and this is something that, that, that really kind of hits home with, with me in the Christmas season, is our pathway littered with debris for the return of this king, especially at Christmas time, is our heart littered with a bunch of stuff that I'm not saying isn't important, but it's not the most important thing during this, this season of Advent, during Christmas. If our heart's littered with stuff that's preventing the, the Christ of Christmas to reign supreme during this season, then we need to ask for help 
and trust in the power of the Holy Spirit to start getting this stuff out of the way, moving it aside. I'm not saying don't enjoy the Christmas season. I'm not talking about not buying gifts and enjoying even the traditions that we hold. Those are fun. Those are wonderful experiences. But there is one that truly supersedes all of that. And that's Christ. And that's Jesus. And that's the fact that the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. So in a moment, we're going to pray. We're going to have an opportunity, too, because we're going to end the service today with the partaking of the Lord's Supper. And we're going to take a moment to, to, to look within ourselves and, and, and to really look deep and to examine our, our lives. And I want you to examine it in two ways. Number one, don't take this if you're not a Christian. Because number one, if you take it as a Christian, you don't understand this. You see on the front of the table, it says, do this in remembrance of me. You're doing it in remembrance of what Christ has done for you. And if you haven't truly tasted of him, you haven't eaten of his flesh and drank of his blood. And what I mean by that, you haven't placed your faith in what he's done for you on the cross and believe in his resurrection. You're not doing anything in remembrance of him. This doesn't save you. It has no sacramental value. But we do it in remembrance of what he's done for us. So number one, we want to examine, are we of the faith? But number two, are we living out our faith? Because faith in Christ isn't, yeah, I came to, to Christ 20-some uh, years ago. No, it's, yes, I came to faith in Christ. I was born again, but I'm still living for Christ today. Sometimes we get off the path. If we have, if, if, if our lives have gotten littered with a bunch of stuff, we examine ourselves and say, God, examine me. Look deep within me. If there's any way that's offensive unto you, Get it out of there. We're going to take that opportunity in a moment to do that so that we can come before the Lord's table and receive it as it is intended to be received. So I'm going to ask you now to, to bow your heads, and I want you to pray silently. And, and I would have Scott and George, if you guys want to come up, and, and they're going to assist in, in this. And, and then I'm going to close this with a word of prayer. But I want to, I want to take this time for myself as well uh, to, to examine have the Lord examine my heart. So let's bow our heads quietly for just a moment as we prepare for, for the Lord's Supper.